Welcome to the Successful Athletes Podcast, where we interview successful athletes to make you a faster cyclist. And today we're joined by Cameron Siemens out of Glendale, Arizona. How's it going? Pretty good, man. I appreciate you doing this. You reached out through trainerroad.com slash podcast to get onto this podcast and shared your story. And it's got some interesting things that apply to a lot of us, even though the context is pretty different. So you right now are a third year med student or med school student, and you've been training all throughout this process. So I want to talk to you today about how you fit your training in amongst all the craziness, because chances are most of us listening to this have some sort of responsibilities that lie outside of just training on our bikes and getting faster. And as a result, we have to find ways to fit it in. So, but before we get into anything, can you give us your background first? How old are you? What's your family situation like? And then let's get into talking about med school after that. Yeah, I'm 26 years old, married, just my wife and I, no kids yet. So. And then med school, most people, I think were familiar with the concept of med school, but possibly not the reality of it. Uh, somebody listening to this may just think, well, he's just a student. However, med school is a bit of a different thing. Can you explain the sort of time demands that you, that med school puts on you in terms of whereas a normal person might work a 40 hour week and then have time that they dedicate to family and other things as well. What's your time allotment like in terms of how much time does med school take for you? How much time do you have available to train? Yeah, it's a little different between the different years. Like the first two years are all lecture based work. And thankfully now with technology, we're able to do a lot of our lectures online, but it's obviously a considerable amount. In my school, we would have two exams every week, every Wednesday and Monday morning. And so as you ramp up to those, you'd obviously increase your studying just to review all the material. And I would say I'd probably put in 50 to 60 hours. I'd want to say like 10 hour days, Monday through Saturday, just about just to keep up. And then I Sunday, I've always tried to keep off as much as I can just to keep my mind fresh. Yeah. And now, now in the third and fourth years where I'm at now, um, we get a chance to rotate through different clinics in the area. And that assumes more of a normal work week, depending on which rotation you're at. Obviously surgery has higher demands, family practice clinic less so. And then on top of that, you still have to study because we have exams at the end of each rotation block. And so you have Mm -hmm. to keep up with the material and prep for those exams on top of your work. So a partnering of practical experience and then also traditional studying and the traditional academic process that you go through with studying tests and and that circular movement. Is it when you mentioned that you were dedicating somewhere around 10 hours a day to it, that's like the time that you spend to lectures and to studying. Are you also like spending time studying outside of that as well? Or did you try to time box that so then you could dedicate yourself to other pursuits? I tried to box it as well as I could, and I wouldn't do it necessarily like 10 hours straight. I'd do a couple hours here, take a break, a couple hours here, like take break for food and stuff. Mm. And then, yeah, that that's kind of how I did it just for my own mental health. <laughs> yeah, of course. Cause that's a big concern for those that, uh, the, the demand is really high. Uh, number one, to get into med school, you have to have, you have to be a consider or a very like an exceptional applicant to be even get into to med schools. It's difficult. Once you get there, competition is high and it's, you really have to do a lot of work to be able to maintain that. So it's interesting because it's not like perhaps even though you time box it to 10 hours, it's probably not like you could decom like completely disconnect from it and live I guess, devoid of that stress for that time period that you had. I assume that it's also in addition to the time that you dedicate to it, that it's also a pretty stressful endeavor, like a high stress thing. Is, is that something that let's dive into training with this? Did that compromise your training at all? And how did you fit your training into this schedule? Um, with training, I, you just kind of have to have a healthy relationship with it is the best way to put it. I, Obviously some days I've, I've got a big test coming up or I'm in the hospital for the whole day. And if I can't fit it in that day, I just kind of have to accept that and not beat myself up too much for it, even though I do catch myself doing it sometimes, <laughs> but it goes the other way too. Cause I found that the training really helped me keep myself focused on my study. I always felt that I could study a lot better and more committed to it when I had a good workout in. 
Yeah, I'm sure you failed workouts at some point throughout the past few years in med school. How did you manage that sort of discouragement? Because you're kind of with med school, you're kind of on a train that keeps going and you have to stay on that train. You can't just turn that down. Your training is the one that has to budge. Yeah, it just comes down to setting my priorities. And obviously my wife and school took priority number one and training was there as an additional thing. And where it, when it didn't help me, like when I felt like I was too fatigued and I needed to take a break coming into a test, I kind of play it by ear like that. No doubt. Now, when did you fit in your training and what sort of training volume did you do? Yeah, I fluctuate mostly between mid and low volume, depending on how much running I'm doing or not. We'll get into that later. But mm -hmm. um, normally I find I do the best with early mornings. I normally get up between 4.30 and 5 a.m. and just try to knock it out first thing in the morning. And that way I can get the rest of my day and not have to worry about setting aside time for that. But with the clinical rotations now too, sometimes those start really early. And so occasionally I'll do it in the evenings as well, just depending on which month I'm doing. Mm. And when you get up that early, how have you fueled that? How do you, cause that's a big barrier that a lot of people find is that getting up early, it's hard to bring about the motivation that usually comes with practice, but the fueling part of things is really tough. So, so how do you do solve that? Yeah, that's a huge thing that I've kind of played with over the last year or so. Um, at first, I wasn't really doing anything unless it was two hours or more, which wasn't very often during the week. But in the last year, I've started feeling a lot more. And now pretty much every time I hit an hour and a half, I take in about 80 to 90 grams an hour of carbohydrates, um, both between a mix that I make with some maltodextrin and Gatorade powder, and then some bars to add to it. That's, that's a, how did you go about that process of making your own drink? Uh, let's talk about that really quick. Cause I think that's, here's the thing, 90 grams of, of carbs an hour. We talk about this very regularly on the ask a cycling coach podcast. If you can get to that point, maybe even surpass that point, you start to feel like you're cheating. Like it's, it's crazy how much of a performance can you get, but the cost is extremely high especially if you're using like traditional products that are widely available and well-known for having that two to one glucose to fructose ratio. It's so expensive. If you start to look at like how much you spend in gasoline to drive your car and then how much you spend to go the same distance on your bike, so to speak, it's the, the car is more economical. So, so how, how have you gone about the process of making your own drink and going through there? It's, been experimentation a lot. Yeah. Um, actually, the most recent formula I've been using is something I found on the Trainer Road forum um, that someone's saying that he's been making a Gatorade two to one mixture with maltodextrin. And then I add a little bit of sodium citrate to it too, just to get a little bit of extra electrolytes in because once you water down the Gatorade, you don't get as much of the electrolytes. But I've also gone through times where I use like maple syrup and table salt. Um, I've used liquid IV, like the little electrolyte packets before. But uh, I found that this Gatorade, this seems to be the best one that I've been able to tolerate well and is really cheap and easy. So that's just standard Gatorade powder. And then where do you get the maltodextrin? Off of Amazon. You can find it Perfect. pretty <laughs> online. Yeah. Yeah. I assume you buy it in some sort of a bulk container and then you're able to, to even drop the cost even further with that. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a cool approach. And I think that we talk about, and you should head over to the trainer road forum uh, right here. Like, uh, like cam saying, because that's a good way for you to be able to find out a lot of information and helpful people will be able to answer any questions you have with that. I've experimented with making my own as well. And, and it's a cool process and it makes you faster. So, uh, with that, now let's talk about how you actually typically fit it in. You said you trained earlier in the morning and then after training early in the morning, you would then go and fulfill your needs and duties with, with law or with med school. How did you ever find just with how rough testing schedules end up being finals, everything else like that, when you were missing workouts or when you had to adjust them, how did you rebound from that? And how did you keep it, everything on track? Did you have any sort of formula or things that you considered beforehand when you knew you were going to miss workouts? Um, going into it, not necessarily. I more just fit in more training when I have more time. Like if I have a three day weekend, I go the weekend warrior route and just mm -hmm. load it all in on Saturday and Friday or Monday, whatever day it's off. Um, yeah. but 
it's just being nice to yourself and giving yourself a break when other priorities trump training and then trying to be as consistent as you can because finding a routine really helps me stay on track with my studying with my tests and everything else yeah and now how has that changed with clinical rotations now that you're in your third year and then of course going into the fourth year have you had to change things profoundly in terms of how you structure schedule or manage the adjustments yeah, that one it's, I'm still experimenting because rotations change each month. And so it's a different schedule every single month. And I can't really predict what the next one will be till I get there. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of it's on the fly. <laughs> <laughs> um, makes it hard to sign up for any events, but I mean, that's not going on right now. So I don't have to worry too much about that, but um, yeah, it's just more seeing what time I have available. And if I can fit it in the morning, trying to do that and if not trying to find what time I can in the afternoons to do so. Sure. Um, but yeah, that flexibility is the key thing that I recognize there's rather than fretting about what you can't control and can't predict, you simply are ready to adapt and the priorities have to be what they are. Right. Um, let's get into some of the events you've done throughout this period of training, med school, everything else, and how you use train road to do the whole thing. So first one I want to talk about is the triple bypass. That's a common century or a, a famous century, I should say, that people have heard of. It's in Colorado, uh, more or less, uh, kind of parallels I-70 in a lot of ways. Uh, and it starts just inland or just into the mountains from Golden, Colorado. And then you end up at Vail, uh, three passes later, 12,000 feet of climbing later, somewhere around like 120 miles. Uh, it's a big ride. So how did you plan for that? Because in many cases, that's an ultra, that's considered almost like an ultra endurance sort of event for a lot of people. But you, with being in med school, you couldn't just put in 12 hour days, everything else. So what sort of plans did you follow with Trainer Road and what sort of improvements did you see on that process? Yeah, um, so that was back in 2018 when I did that, which was the summer right before I started med school. But Mm. obviously I was still going through like the MCAT before into that application process, but my time was a little more free then. And I tried to cram it in then, but that was actually my first century. So I wow. came in a little humbled <laughs> and realizing the year before was the first year I'd started cycling. My father-in-law is a big cyclist and he kind of got me into it in 2017. And then I signed up with him originally to do the triple bypass. Cause he's done it a couple times. And he ended up not being able, he had to pull out last minute because he was having some muscle strain issues. And so I went off on my own and I did the mid volume sweet spot one and two mid volume sustained power build and then mid volume, um, century plan were the ones oh, that I perfect. And awesome. leading up to it, I did the Rockwell relay or vision relay. And that's just a few months before it. As a yeah, prep for it. Chad and I did that event. Um, that was that was fun and also extremely hard. I think it's called the Coco Pelli Relay or something now. I uh, think that's the current name, yeah. Yeah, super cool event. It goes from from east to west across the uh, southern portion of the state of Utah. Um, so, so with this triple bypass, the, the plans are awesome. That was pre plan builder. Now we have plan builder that builds it all out, and that's what it would give you. Of course, it would structure based off your time, but uh, so you followed mid volume and you went into that big long day. And then you were also, you didn't have the normal helping hand that you anticipated having. (laughs) So kind of your first foray into it and you were alone. What sort of improvement did you see in terms of fitness? I don't know if you remember FTP gains and then also then we'll get into the day and how it went and how you executed. Yeah. So the reason I signed up for trainer road was specifically to train for that event really. And Mm -hmm. that's where I first kind of got into indoor training Um, I remember my first test is before the ramp test came out. And so it was the 20 minute test, but I think my FTP was like in the one nineties, like one ninety two or something, if I remember right. And by the time I got to race day, I'd gotten it up to two seventy two. Wow. For the race. That is a massive improvement. Um, and, and how much, yeah, (laughs) the gains are real. (laughs) And how much did you weigh to give people a, a point of reference for that? Um, I'm pretty consistently right around 155. 
awesome. I'm gonna do some quick while well, Google's gonna do some quick math for me. It's about 70 kilograms for for those that that are checking there. So that puts you right around somewhere around you're just under four watts per kilo, I would assume with that. Um with just doing I, I hope I didn't screw that one up. That's mental math. But um but that so that's a huge improvement that you made over that time. What sort of adjustments did you have to get used to? What came as a surprise or a shock? What was difficult for you? getting straight into structured training like that, being relatively new to cycling? Um, just hurting, <laughs> learning the, <laughs> the garage on the trainer. That, that blew me away. Because before that, I'd just done heart rate training, really, to, and just basic, just going out for a ride for fun. Mm. And once I start, especially over-unders, even to this day, I still <laughs> hurt so much. It takes a lot of mental fortitude to get through them sometimes. Yeah. What sort of athletics did you do as a kid? Did you have, what was your background and even maybe into high school or college? I wasn't super active as a kid, um, unfortunately, but once I got into high school, I played football all four years throughout. Oh, cool. So a decent amount of physical activity all throughout the high school then. And then in college, uh, did you, uh, continue to play football or I guess there's probably somewhere around like a three, four year gap maybe until you got into cycling. Yeah. Um, I got, I, I hated it endurance at all in high school. <laughs> More than a mile was like gas in it. I think I'd done like a 5k once or twice there, but, um, before I came to college, I served a two year mission for the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And then some of my companions while I was doing that were really into running. And so I'd start running with them every now and then. And then I don't know where it came from, but in my head, I had this idea that I wanted to do an Ironman and <laughs> triathlon. I, my dad had done a uh, Olympic try when I was probably 11 or 12, something like that. And so it's already been, in my, always been in my head, like, Oh, that was really cool. Like that was a cool experience. And so after I came back, um, I started doing a lot of running until I got a bike mm. just before training for all that stuff. So the original intent was intent was triathlon. Uh, but then you deviated over to cycling for a bit or perhaps better said, focused on cycling at, at first with a triple bypass. Uh, so let's talk about that event and we'll just briefly, cause we'll end up moving on to other things. We could probably dig into the triple bypass for hours here, but how did you end up doing on race day? What, did you have a huge blow up moment? I mean, you were so new to doing any sort of an event like that. Uh, there's probably nutrition equipment, plenty of other things came into play. How'd it go? Um, thankfully I ironed it out a little bit by doing that Coca Pelle Rockwell relay. Cause I'd done it the year before too. And that's, that one blew up the very first time I did yeah. that I was shattered and had to drop out after my second leg, yeah. um, but doing it the second year world's improvement and then coming into triple bypass. I remember hurting a lot and struggling to get into rhythm coming up the second pass, which is the biggest one. It's Loveland pass. If I remember, it goes up to like 12,000 something feet. Very high. <laughs> and the aid station is like two miles before the summit. And so you stop and eat all this food and then have to oh. it. I remember that hurting. Um, and then just kind of grinding through the last little bit coming past that, but. Hmm. Did you develop like a pacing plan that you were trying to stick to? What was the strategy? Yeah. Um, if I remember right, I was trying to stick right around 67, 68% FTP. Um, I did go a little hard out the gate. I got a little excited and hmm. that's probably why I paid and suffered on the later stages of the race. But how'd you fuel? Like, uh, what did you uh, take in for drink and eating? I think then I was just doing pure maltodextrin with, um, I think noon tablets. I was mixing noon tablets with maltodextrin was what I was doing. And then cliff bars as needed. Yeah. Awesome. And what did you learn coming away from that? What were your big takeaways that you learned from that event from triple bypass? Even pacing is your friend <laughs> <laughs> out of the gun. Um, yeah, that, that's the big thing. Just learning to pace myself and knowing that I could go the distance and hmm. stick your mind to it and keep going, keep pedaling. Well, this is important because you end up pivoting thereafter and you end up going for a half Ironman, uh, which, how long was the gap between that 
uh, the triple bypass and then this half Ironman and which race did you pick and why? Yeah, my story may have been a little mixed up on the forum, but I actually did the half Ironman before I started. Oh, you did? Cycling. So that was in 2017. I done. I built up. I did a couple Olympic sp- tr- tries, and then built up to a 70.3 right before I then started doing the longer distance cycling stuff the next year. Oh, cool. So so you had done you had done try before, and then that ended up causing you to pivot over to cycling thereafter. Um, yeah. So I, what caused that? What caused the divergence from, did you meet your goals in try and you got to do that event like you had seen your dad do, but you did the half Ironman or was it just a deviation over to cycling for a bit and you plan on going back for a full someday? Yeah. More just a little bit of ADD. I, I yeah. like, that's why I like triathlon. And even, even still, I like throwing runs in, even if I'm doing a dedicated cycling block, I just like variety. I feel like it makes me a stronger athlete too, like more mm. well-rounded. Um, I didn't necessarily meet the goals I wanted to and try. I plan to continue racing them, but just like to bounce around and change goals every now and then. Sure. So which race did you do for the half Ironman? And then did you use trainer road for that one? Or was that pre your, before your trainer road days? That was before trainer road. Um, but I did the, the Brian man, it's the state Utah, Utah state championship. Um, in, in just in salt lake oh cool brine man i guess a play on the on the word salt and the salt lake i assume yeah the bike course around is really cool you go across the bridge to antelope island and back so oh cool and do you actually swim in the salt lake the great salt lake no it's a small little strip of reservoir that was really close to it though and got it yeah because I, I i assumed the buoyancy would be out of this world. If you're swimming in the other one, I don't know if that would make you faster or slower. Uh, that's, that, that'd be interesting to see. Um, so I guess with, uh, transitioning from that now you've done, and I think this has happened. Have you been doing running events after the triple bypass or did those come before as well? Um, like I said, running was kind of my introduction to cycling and I didn't do any events beforehand though. I just, would run. I, I got a little crazy about, it. I'd go just on 10 mile runs, like without ramping up to it, just randomly. Like whenever I felt <laughs> like I had time during my undergraduate school, like a um, cyclist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then I got into the try stuff that got into cycling. And I realized I loved biking almost more than I did paved running. And then that's what kind of per- pushed me to do some of the more long distance cycling stuff. Got it. Okay. So when did you start doing, cause this is an interesting point that I want to discuss with you, your running events. Cause you've actually done some ultra distance running events, uh, a 50 K and a 50 mile. And you actually placed really well in those. I believe that you got like top 15. Um, I believe, you know, you got top 10 eighth overall in the 50 K and then 12th in your 50 miler. So that's like, those are impressive results. Um, what made you go to ultra distance running? And then let's talk about how you still maintain some cycling training amidst all of that and why you did that. Yeah. The last year of my undergrad, which was 2018. So kind of towards the end, just after that triple bypass event that I'd done, um, I moved to North Salt Lake and the, we were staying in my in-laws place and there was super easy trail access from their house. And so I kind of just started saying, oh, let's go explore. Let's go run on some trails. And I'd never really done it before and completely fell in love with it and Mm -hmm. almost as much as cycling. And so coming into med school and the, in fall of 2018, I kind of had the intention of trying to do an ultra while I was here. And so in, I think it was December 1st or 2nd, first week of December, they had a, it's called the McDowell mountain marathon which was the one I did. That was the 50 K that I did. And that was my first ultra. And so I went straight from triple bypass training to completely flipping it and going into long run training. Was that difficult at all to get used to that? And how did you get used to the running side of things? I know we don't, you know, specifically train runners here at trainer road, but it's a, it's, there is overlap and there's a lot of questions around athletes that do both. So was that a difficult adaptation period that you went through going from cycling to running? It wasn't too bad from what I remember. I mean, 
once you get the longer runs, there's a lot more fatigue in the legs than there are from cycling events. Like even a three or four hour run, will just zap you Mm -hmm. bike. You can just do that at zone two and not feel too toasted afterwards. So that, that was the big, the long runs, especially ramping up to those ultra events. Mm, yeah, I can imagine. Uh, did you deal with any sort of injury, uh, starting off with it? Cyclists famously, uh, deal with plenty of injuries whenever they decide to go for a run. Yeah, I had a back injury, but that was before I started running. I didn't have any overuse injuries though. Once I started running. Awesome. Do you maintain any sort of strength training or PT like a root mobility routine at all? Probably not as good as I should, but I, <laughs> I try to, when I remember just mainly doing planks and core work and I'll throw in some push ups and the pull-ups, but nothing that I've been doing consistently. Sure. Um, so throughout your run training, as I understand it, you still actually maintain some volume on the bike. What was your intention there and what sort of training were you doing at that time? Yeah. Coming off of the long cycling events, I realized how much I enjoyed trainer road and how much of a workout I got from it. And so when I flipped to start doing ultra training, I had the intention of maintaining all the gains that I'd made. And so I, but knowing that I wouldn't have as much time, I flipped to a low volume plan and I've played around with different ones. I think I can't remember which ones I was doing specifically did probably just sweet spot base and maybe sustained power build if I remember right. But mm. uh, just mainly just getting an hour or two where I could. So did you find, cause this is the big question that a lot of people have. Did you find any benefit from that sort of training transferring over to your running? Clearly it would have helped you maintain as a cyclist, but did you find any benefit on the running side from that? I think so. I mean, I haven't compared it without cycling at all, so I mm. can't say for sure, but the big thing with running is I didn't mention this earlier, but you can't just go and do threshold runs or sweet spot runs two or three times a week. Like you can in cycling, just because your legs get so much sore, there's a lot more impact, a lot more risk for injury. And so I'm a big believer in just mostly easy runs, kind of like that 80, 20 polarized training approach for running just to avoid injury. Mm. Um, and so because of that, I found that trainer road was super helpful because it gave me that intensity and really tuning the other sides of my endurance in aerobic and anaerobic and VO2 max training while still being able to maintain just easy zone two running on top of that with stripes mm. thrown in here and there. It, it's an interesting point. We talk about this all the time on the podcast, but, uh, when it comes down to it, race day performance is all about how you've trained the energy systems that you're going to use on race day. Right. And your body doesn't know that it's 50 Ks or it doesn't know that it's, you know, uh, whatever mileage, the distance, it just cares about what energy systems it's going to use and what that sort of strain on that energy system is going to be. And it's interesting how it basically, when you can target that with specific training, you can have those benefits. Clearly there's muscular benefits and everything else that you were getting from the running, but it is interesting. There, there can be some translation there. Um, once again, another point that just goes down to training energy systems. Um, so with the running stuff, how is it different? Like, have you changed your nutrition? Do you have to eat and drink differently when you're running versus cycling, doing an ultra event? I did at first, it was a lot harder to tolerate food at all, especially like those really concentrated mixes. I'd get like vomit in the back of my throat sometimes <laughs> at the very beginning of it. And so I'd had to tone it down, but over time I've built it back up now where I can do 300 calories an hour, either biking or running without too much of an issue. Nice. And then what about with the, the running side of things, did that detract from your cycling? Like, have you noticed that it's dropped a lot as a result of focusing more on running? I, it hasn't dropped too much. I right now I kind of fluctuate between 240 to 270 Watts for my FTP, um, mainly above 250 though, for the most time, mm. um, so it hasn't, it hasn't detracted too much just because I like to keep that cycling volume in that probably at least maintains my cycling fitness where it is. Sure. So that means that you're probably like a, a good sweet spot for you is hovering somewhere around three to 500 TSS, somewhere around there, I assume with on the bike, somewhere around three to 400, maybe. Um, and you can maintain with that. And then if you rise it up from there, you could get even more. Sure. But 
that's cool to see that you've kind of like found like the spot where it's like a floor almost that you don't drop down below. I want to talk about what's next for you. So there's a number of different things. First of all, let's kind of jump back to med school. What's next for you? Because you might be moving and who knows, they might not have, uh, events running stuff, anything else like that. Do you know what you're going to do in terms of professionally speaking after med school? Yeah, um, I don't know where right now because with med school, after you graduate, you have to apply for residency positions and kind of like coming to med school, you throw your hat in the ring and see where you match and where you end up going. So it'll be an adventure going forward there. <laughs> but right now, I'm most interested in a field of medicine called physical medicine and rehabilitation. Mm. And I'm hoping to be able to do a sports med fellowship from there. But in that residency training, we also learned to deal with spinal cord injuries, traumatic brain injuries, um, amputee rehab, all kinds of stuff. Mainly the reason I like it is because it's helping people move. And I've gotten a lot of benefit and enjoyment from learning to do that. I wasn't always athletic and I want to be able to help other people get that too and enjoy it as well. That's awesome. How cool. Um, thank you for doing that, by the way, for, for pursuing something, a noble cause like that. I, 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 something that comes to mind right there is Craig hospital and, uh, that, that one out in Denver, they do a lot of work with spinal cord injuries, brain, uh, some, some severe brain trauma injuries, everything else like that. So, um, and Craig, by the way, if for anybody listening to that, anybody at Craig hospital, thank you so much for all the great work you do to help out plenty of cyclists that have been in some tough spots and triathletes too. So, uh, now let's talk outside of the professional side. What's next for you in terms of events you've done Ironmans or half Ironman you've done centuries, you've done ultra runs. Uh, are there any sort of formats that you're looking at next, like racing formats that you're eager to do? Yeah, I still want to do a full, I, in 2019, I was training for one, but it got canceled because it was a small local event and didn't get enough people to register for it. So that one, and I did, I did all the mid volume training for it in a month out. They said, Oh, oh we have man. So what was, was that like? What was that like to go through that full, like the, the full distance training plan process at mid volume for you? Was that uh, did you see good improvements in terms of, of training on the bike, on the run? That's interesting to hear. Yeah, I think it with more, that had more run workouts in it than what I normally did for my ultra training, like in terms of tempo and speed work. And I think that really helped me, especially going on to other ultras. And I, I think it struck a pretty good balance. Um, yeah. And swimming is always my weakness. So I can't criticize the swim plans because anything <laughs> helps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're the same in that respect. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and I guess you never got to see if it really was paying off, right? Uh, Cause you didn't get the big race day. So do you have another event picked out and do you actually have something on the calendar? Yeah. Um, so obviously with everything going on right now, I, for me, I can't justify putting down a lot of money for a big event that I don't know is going to happen or not. So I've kind of, after going through the last few months and now starting to get the itch to race again, after everything being shut down, I've kind of planned a few kind of solo adventures, we'll say. So I'm hoping in April to be able to, I'm going to run the rim to rim to rim run, Whoa. which is the grand from the south rim go to the north and back it's about 42 miles and 10,000 feet of vertical gain over oh, a day that'll be a tough and one then, yeah that, that's a big one and then um my father-in-law we last year we rode the um what's it called the white rim loop in canyon lines national park yeah he's wanting to do that again sometime this spring as well so I'm trying to keep a low, low volume XC marathon build going into that too. Oh, sweet. So then you're kind of like, uh, holding the chips on the table in terms of events until they get back on the calendar. Then you'll probably end up doing a full, uh, at some point. So that'll be exciting, man. Um, any itch to do mountain biking criteriums or anything that seems like a road stage race or gravel race, anything that seems off the wall. Yeah. I like the long stuff if you haven't figured that out yet. So gravel <laughs> sounds really cool. Um, having done the r white rim trail and doing it again, I, I really enjoy the long mountain biking stuff. Um, yeah, any, not so much criteriums. I've done some Tuesday night crits here and doesn't scratch the <laughs> self torture nature of <laughs> the long. 
Yeah, a totally different ball of wax. Well, how cool. Um, Cameron, thank you so much for, for sharing your process and all the things that you've done to be able to fit the training in. Uh, I, I just want to leave and give you the floor to provide any couple, like any tips that you may have for somebody that is facing a difficult schedule right now and struggling to fit in training. What have you found helpful that you would like to tell them? Just be flexible with yourself. Don't beat yourself up about it and try to be as consistent as you can and take the wins where you can. Like that's the biggest thing. I think if you can get a big weekend in, even if it's not on the plan, go and take a big weekend and then get back into it the next week. Yeah. This is the reality for most of us athletes, right? Uh, we don't have a, a perf perfect circumstances to be able to depict exactly how we get to do everything. So thanks so much, Cameron. I appreciate this. If anybody wants to get in touch with you, what's the best way I possibly the trainer road forum. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably the easiest way to reach me. I, if I remember, I think my handle is like sea monster on there or something like that. Cool. <laughs> Clever. <laughs> awesome. Cool. And there will be a forum thread all about this episode. You can look for Cameron's name. That's Cameron Siemens and you can find it on there and you can ask Cameron questions. If you have anything specifically about this episode or otherwise, let him know uh, if you're in Arizona and you have any sort of crazy events, it seems like Cameron's into those too. So let him know. <laughs> Thanks Cameron. We'll talk to you. Thank you.